What's up YouTube? This is another episode of East Coast Power Situates coming to you here with another video. And you may be wondering, what is all of this garbage that I've set out all over my table? Well, I'm going to get into that and just say that uh, East Coast Power Cichlids is uh, leaning a little bit more towards East Coast Power, basically anything else, including what this video is specifically about, isopods. If you don't know what isopods are, if you're n new to the channel or you're, uh, you know, just not acquainted with isopods, they're, they're basically roly, they're, they're roly polies. They're, they're roly polies. And, and, uh, I recently have just gotten like really big into them. If you saw my last fish room update, I gave a little hint at some bins that I had laying inside of one of my 125, uh, aquariums. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't say what they were. And I said I was going to bring them up in a future video and I kind of just forgot and I never did but now that the time is coming and I'm actually going to be setting up enclosures and getting isopods and stuff like that I decided I would go ahead and start a little bit of a series documenting me setting up my isopod enclosures getting isopods taking care of them and all that stuff and I just want to emphasize that this is not necessarily supposed to be taken as a care video because I personally do not have enough experience with isopods to be able to tell you how to keep them. However, I am doing this for my own benefit to document how I'm doing all of this and showing you guys how I personally am going to be trying to set them up and if I do really good with my isopods whenever I get all of them, then you'll know that you should try what I'm doing and if I get my isopods and all of them die, you know that East Coast Power Cichlids guy is a complete idiot and not to follow anything he's doing when it comes to isopods. So, you may be wondering, uh, why do I need this, this much stuff for isopods? And again, I'm no professional, don't take this as fact. But though isopods are pretty easy animals to take care of and they are very cheap generally, it is, I would say, best with isopods and with any other animal to have a very large variety of different materials uh, in their enclosure to help aid them in replicating the best natural environment you can for them while also providing them sufficient hiding spots, sufficient uh, substrate, uh, versatility in their diet and all that kind of stuff. So. so now let's just get into everything that I have splayed out here as well as some other stuff that it is not in frame and just show you exactly what all I'm going to be using. I'll be using some Zoomed Eco Earth Cocoa Fiber Substrate as my base substrate. You can buy this in a three pack or you can buy them singularly depending on how many isopod enclosures and what size you plan to set up. Some 100% natural lump charcoal. Make sure it is 100% natural and not to be confused with charcoal briquettes that are made for grilling. It needs to be 100% natural charcoal. 
some water to soak the eco earth substrate. A drill in a couple different sizes of drill bits to drill ventilation holes in your container. A couple of five gallon buckets with lids to help you mix substrate. Some 100% natural long fiber sphagnum moss that I got from Lowe's Hardware. A pair of scissors. I will primarily be feeding my isopods a mixture of Rapashi Bug Burger and Rapashi Morning Wood. The Rapashi Bug Burger is a more protein based diet for some of the more carnivorous species of isopods I'll be getting, while the morning wood is for some of the isopods that prefer feeding on decaying plant material. You'll need a hot glue gun as well as a decent amount of hot glue sticks. The cuddle bone meant for birds as a vitamin and calcium source for the isopod shells. Some sterilized rotting wood or alternatively you can use some cork bark. Some type of container to house the isopods in. You can use virtually any plastic or glass container you'd like. Some type of strainer to rinse the sphagnum moss If out you're only trying to keep smaller species of isopods Pods, or you just want a smaller colony of isopods, you can get away with keeping them in large jelly cups or even Tupperware containers. I'll be using these sweet gum tree seed pods as refuge for my baby isopods whenever they breed. They can get up into the little tiny holes to get away from the parents if need be. I'll be using this aluminum screen mesh to cover the holes I drill in the container to keep the isopods from escaping while still maintaining good ventilation. Some eggshells that I not only like to put in the enclosures as hides, but I also crush it up and mix it into the substrate as an alternate calcium source. A spray bottle full of purified water for misting the enclosures. Some organic topsoil as a filler substrate and also as a source of natural organic matter for the the isopods to feed some on. Some sterilized hardwood leaves such as oak leaves or magnolia leaves. And here's a little example and overview of what everything I bought for isopods looks like all together. It looks like a whole lot but honestly this did not cost me much money at all. It's a very cheap hobby to get into and I do encourage anybody who'd actually be interested in keeping them to go ahead and give them a try. So the first thing I'll be using for my custom substrate mix is the cocoa fiber that I showed you earlier. Per one brick, the instructions say to add a whole gallon of water. However, I found that two thirds of a gallon was perfectly sufficient and honestly made it a little bit wetter than I would have liked. Once you've added the water, wait about 20 to 30 minutes and mix it around as you wait to make sure that the water is being evenly distributed. I'll also be getting some of those oak leaves that I showed you earlier and pulverizing them into a powder to mix into my substrate. That will further enrich the isopods diet. And this is roughly the consistency I'm looking for after I crush up the leaves. Now I get the leaves and mix them into my topsoil. Then I get the topsoil leaf mixture and mix it into my cocoa fiber until I have a consistency that I like. Now I get most of the eggs and crush them into a powder, but be careful because I did cut my hand doing I then this. get my crushed eggshells and mix it into the rest of my substrate. Now it's time for me to start rinsing the sphagnum moss. By the time you've rinsed it off, one bag equals about a quarter of a five gallon Now bucket. I'm gonna go ahead and wash off all of the charcoal to get all this black powder off of it. All right, so now we're going to begin setting up the bins themselves, starting with drilling holes in them. Depending on the species and what type of ventilation, how much humidity they like, I did drill a different number of holes in each individual bin. Now I'm cutting the wire mesh to size, placing it onto it, make sure it's a good fit up against the holes. And then I'm hot gluing it on directly to the surface of the bin. I like to use hot glue. It's just really easy to use. I don't try to make it look fancy. I just wad it on there. As long as it's effective and it does its job, I really couldn't care less about what it looks like. Now it's time to start putting some of the material into the bin itself, starting with roughly, give or take, two inches of the cocoa fiber substrate that I made earlier. Putting some of the hard materials into the enclosure such as an eggshell, some charcoal, and a piece of rotting wood. Now I add some of the sweet gum seed pods for the babies to hide in, and some sphagnum moss to keep the wet side nice and wet. 
move stuff around, make sure it's to how I like it. A little bit of charcoal underneath the sphagnum moss. Now some magnolia leaves. I use the magnolia leaves instead of the oak leaves because they break down a little bit slower and uh, they'll just last a lot longer. Now some cuttlefish bone as a calcium and vitamin source. A little bit underneath the wood, a little bit out in the open, as well as a little bit underneath the sphagnum moss so that no matter where they are, they can get some. Here's a little overview of all of my different enclosures that I made. So I made six of them. And now a little over the top view so you can see what all of them look like from above. Alright guys, so that concludes the first installment of my isopod quest that I've just begun. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. Um, I did my best to cover everything that I was doing and I think I covered everything I did. So. Again, I want to stress this enough, just like in the beginning of this video, I don't want this to come off as a care video. I don't know enough about isopods to be able to tell you how to take care of them. Uh, every, basically everything I said in this video, everything I've done in the video is just me essentially regurgitating what other people have told me and what I've read off of websites and things like that. So uh, don't take anything I, I said as fact or anything I don't know enough about this subject to be able to say that I'm an all-knowing isopod master. So tune into my next video which will be my video on unboxing the isopods that I've ordered that are currently in the mail as we speak. So as soon as I get those in a couple of days I'll be filming a video unboxing them and showing you what I got. I got multiple different varieties to fill uh, a good portion of the bins that I have over there. So with that said, I hope you enjoyed the video. Tune in next time. Comment, rate, subscribe. Respect the hobby. Respect the hobbyist. And in this case, I guess respect the isopods. So, peace out.